It's Friday, April 23. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is calling for more funding to mitigate the impact of climate change on developing countries. Speaking at the World Leaders Summit on Climate Change on Thursday, Mr. Holness said that accessible and equitable climate finance mechanism is needed to build resilience against climate change. The world committed to $100 billion per year to support climate action in developing countries. It is critical that this commitment not only be honored, but that the ambition be increased and major emitters should contribute more to its financing. We welcome President Biden's announcement in this regard. I encourage all governments to play their part in achieving this goal and the private sector must also be engaged. Mr. Holness notes that while some progress has been made, significant hurdles remain. We need to take specific actions to include one, the establishment of a global disaster fund to help SIDS recover and manage disaster risk. Two, the development of innovative risk-informed financing for disasters and climate events. Three, the inclusion of vulnerability measures as the prime consideration in determining access for financing rather than only income criteria. And four, the scaling up of debt for climate adaptation swaps to simultaneously address climate crises and the systemic debt issues affecting already burdened developing countries. Jamaica has great sprinters. And we know that a great start does not guarantee a win. It requires momentum building. In this case, an accessible and equitable climate finance mechanism. He says despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, Jamaica remains committed to advancing climate action by enhancing its nationally determined contributions to target a 60% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. Minister of Health and Wellness Dr. Christopher Tufton says there is some movement in the right direction where Jamaica's COVID-19 positivity rate is concerned. He gave an update of the ministry's epidemiological assessment during his contribution to the sectoral debate this week. Minister of Health and Wellness Dr. Christopher Tufton says Jamaica's COVID-19 virus reproductive rate has fallen over the last four weeks. Our reproductive rate over the last four weeks, Madam Speaker, have moved from 1.3% 1.3 to 0.9, I should say, from 1.3 to 0.9. This really means that we are moving in a direction where the spread of the virus is decreasing or declining, and below one, not ideally where we want it to be, we would like it to be somewhere in the region of 0.7. But certainly, going below one means the spread, the rate of spread um, that each person with COVID um, is, is responsible for is at a rate that is less than the capacity to double or increase the, the extent of the virus beyond our capacities uh, currently. He says the reduction in the number of cases is due mainly to lockdowns and other restrictions on movement. Dr. Tofton says his ministry is very mindful of the sacrifices made by the Jamaican society by obeying the restrictive safety measures. Sacrifices, however, Madam Speaker, the individual level, the family level, the community and organizations, uh, sacrifices by all. These sacrifices have resulted in many hardships, we understand, for the men and women who have had to give up their livelihoods and bear the economic brunt of lockdowns or other forms of restrictions and movement. And I have to say, on behalf of the entire government and the Ministry of Health and Wellness team who have been in the field championing the response, that we understand the sacrifices and we say thanks to the Jamaican people. Minister Tufton told his colleagues 
that some 135,000 Jamaicans received their first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And while population inoculation has been relatively successful thus far, vaccine supply remains a challenge. The slow rate of vaccination can result in higher rates of mutation and the possibility of low efficacy rates for vaccines that have already been administered. And this is advocated by the scientists and more recently by the, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros. And it is something that we have to manage carefully. And as we look across the world, we see where variant strains of the virus are popping up. And that is an area that we have to manage even while we seek to source vaccines, but also champion the cause of vaccine equity across the globe. The Ministry of Health and Wellness will begin administering the second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine in May, and persons are asked to visit the vaccination sites on the date and time indicated on their COVID-19 vaccination card. Jamaica has sent needed supplies to our regional neighbours in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Local Government and Rural Development Minister Desmond McKenzie oversaw the departure of the shipment on Thursday morning. These supplies included bottled water, canned foods, tents for emergency shelters and portable toilets. Today I am extremely honoured and proud to be a part of this. As we have seen again what cooperation at the highest level can do in times of crisis. The La Soufère volcano on the north side of St. Vincent began erupting on April 9 for the first time in 42 years. This has led to the evacuation of about 20,000 people. Rain water harvesting and irrigation practices have become the norm for some farmers in St. Thomas, especially with the receipt of irrigation equipment and techniques under the Irrigation Systems Consultancy Project. Watershed Officer at NEPA, Andre Reed, says just about 315 farmers from 11 districts in St. Thomas and St. Andrew have benefited from the program. He says the eight-month-long project, which began in July 2020, ended last month. According to Mr. Reed, the project was a success despite the impact of the pandemic. So once we were looking at the context of the project and we're looking at towards the end of it, we realized that we would have implemented most of our activities and we saw some savings, some cost savings. And we said, all right, how can we then encourage the farmers to continue doing the work on their farms that are so beneficial to us, but at the same time providing a benefit to these farmers? And we said, okay, well, it's twofold, as I said. You look at the fact that we would have provided them with trees, and we want those trees to survive. There's no way the trees are going to survive without water. So if we put in these irrigation systems, and immediately we're actually ensuring the survivability of these trees. But at the same time, we are incentivizing the farmers to continue their efforts because we'd have taught them under the project all of the activities that they can do to ensure that there is no sediment loss. But at the same time, all of that comes at a cost to the farmer. So you notice we keep on saying the farmer, the farmer, the farmer. And at the same time, as I said, the socioeconomic conditions up there are very restrictive. So where possible, we try to provide some benefit to the farmer so that they can continue doing that work, so that we can continue seeing that reduction over the years in sedimentation coming out of the watersheds. He says the targeted farmers are using lands that cover part of the area above the Yalos and Hope River watersheds that supplies 42% of the water to the Kingston metropolitan area. Director of Project Management and Coordination at the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA, Dwayne Henry, says the farmers are practicing what they have learned. The farmers were very, very responsive in terms of what it, the project offers. When they, when they heard about um, a thousand gallon tanks um, as a part of the, the package, everyone wanted a tank to begin with because as, as uh, Mr. Reed would have mentioned, these farmers are also being affected by the lack of water on the hillside, right? So immediately heard about the water tanks, they immediately bought into it, right? Then 
just you, you, you mentioned be honest. Some of the farmers they really wanted the water tank. The rainwater harvesting sheds uh, it's it's a natural fit with the water tank. You harvest the water, it is stored into the, into the tanks, right? The project was done in partnership with the RADA and other environmental entities. Without a doubt, we would have achieved. I mean, when we started the process, you would have, well, if you work back the maths in your mind, you'd recognize that we were in the middle of the pandemic, the height of it. That was the very start. Everyone was running scared, so to speak. And we would have tasked RADA with a somewhat impossible task. In terms of the supply chains, all of that was impacting on the successful implementation of the irrigation systems consultancy. There were moments when we had discussion with RADA and we would have heard that there are no tanks available, there are no, there are no um, drip irrigation systems available. So it was a whole different ballgame in terms of implementing this component within a pandemic. But RADA stood their ground. RADA was able to pull this project through despite the existing realities, and they were able to deliver a successful project at the end of it. Both Mr. Reed and Mr. Henry shared the news at a recent JIS think tank. Some farmers in Yalas St. Thomas are calling for help. Their crops are in danger from beet armyworms. A beet armyworm is a voracious agricultural pest insect that affects crops globally. My name is Winston Henriquez from Yalas Division. I am a farmer, yeah, and when we need some help, yeah, because the um, beet armyworm is here um, mashing up our farm. We call it rather, they don't have any help uh, to hear us. We call Ministry of Agriculture, they say, with, at least they say we must go to the radar. Radar not have any help to help us. We are asking someone who, who is hearing, who is listening, if they can assist us. Because our crop, this crop here is just six weeks away from harvest. And if, if it continues like this, we won't have anything. Look at it. In a tree day, tree day, we feel gone. The farmers say they have used pesticides and other chemicals to combat the pests, but to no avail. They're appealing for help from the authorities. We use all different types of chemical, and the chemical is not working, so we are asking the government to see what they can do for us. Time now for the business report with Gabriel Thompson. In Thursday's trading session, the JSE combined index advanced by 415 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 90 stocks of which 38 advanced, 34 declined and 18 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 23 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services Limited and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited and Caribbean Cream Limited. Trading firm were Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, Carreras Limited and Dolphin Cove Limited. Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with 2.4 million units followed by Alaska Manufacturing Limited with 2.3 million units and JMMB Group Limited with over 1.2 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, April 21, the U.S. dollar ended trading at $154.39. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $121.01. The pound sterling traded for $213.40, and the euro ended trading at $186.24. Oil prices were little changed on Thursday as concerns over low crude production in Libya offset expectations that rising coronavirus cases in India and Japan would cause energy demand to decline. Libya says its oil production fell to about 1 million barrels per day in recent days and could drop even further due to budgetary issues. 
Brent crude oil futures edged up eight cents to sixty-five dollars forty cents a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose eight cents to end at sixty-one dollars forty-three cents a barrel. Are you invisible at work? It could cost you millions. Financial coach Denise Williams of Financially Focused says if you are not building a case for promotions or salary increases or not demanding better service from your financial advisor, you are losing millions of dollars. She says you are wealthier than you think. You have a scenario where someone will say to you, oh my God, you know, I have 10, 15, 20 years experience on the job, but I get passed over for promotions. You know, younger people come to the office and they earn more than me, or they're moved up the career track much faster than me. And that's a source of really, really terrible stress. So what I have found is when someone is really struggling to be at the forefront of the human resource manager, HR's mind, in terms of promotion or you know salary increases or just general upward movement, they're also having that same relationship with their financial advisor, banker, accountant, tax professional, you name it. Anyone that is supposed to help them with money is not. So they're being overlooked at work and overlooked in the world of investments and money management. And guess what? Over the course of your working life, this will cost you millions. No question about it. You're being overlooked um, at work. You're not increasing your earnings. You're not increasing your the value of your human capital and your career portfolio is not going where it should go. And so, you know, definitely want you to not have this experience. It's horrible. So what can we do for you? Well, you know, what we have actually, which will more help you on the finance side, you know, and the investment side, and it may spill over to your career. We have a free 21 day challenge to supercharge your investment returns. Because again, if you're being overlooked in your career, you're not getting the attention you deserve in your career. You're also probably not getting the attention you deserve from your banker or your financial advisor. We wanna help you with that. So we have this free 21 day challenge. Just visit our website, www.financiallyfocusedmedia.com and we can help you with this 21 day challenge to supercharge your investment returns. Now, let me declare up front, I talk about day trading or buying options or swing trading or any kind of um, financial engineering magic like that. No, what we're looking at are the steps you need to take to have a more wholesome, fulsome, conversation with your financial professionals so that you stop leaving money on the table. We want you to be better, stronger, more able to negotiate what's yours. You invested your money. You put your money in this financial product. You deserve better. You should get a better return. Yeah, I think so. And in the you know, 15 plus years that I've been in the financial um, world, I've just seen people pushed aside and it's just wrong. So I want to help you to take 21 days and each day incrementally become better at how you engage with financial professionals. For more information on the development of your financial future, head on over to financiallyfocusedmedia.com or find Denise on YouTube at Financially Focused. And on that note, we close this extended edition of the Business Report Inside the News on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. We go now to news from the region. In Trinidad and Tobago, churches will have to reduce their capacity to 25%. However, services will remain at 90 minutes. 
These are among the new restrictions announced by Minister of Health Terence Dalsing on Wednesday at the Ministry's COVID-19 virtual media conference. Kimberly D'Souza tells us more. Chief among the new restrictions announced by Minister of Health Terence Dial Singh at Wednesday's COVID-19 update is a reduction in capacity from 50% to 25% for religious gatherings. We make a special appeal that in places of worship where you attend your prayers, to keep on your masks at all times. Do not take off your masks for any reason. And once your services or prayers are finished, please don't congregate. Please go home. The health minister also announced that weddings and funerals will be limited to 10 persons and there will be no public gatherings for entertainment events and concerts. The new restrictions also extend to the public service, which will revert to 50% capacity on a rotational basis. This will have the effect of taking a few tens of thousands of persons off the transportation grid and collecting in offices because you would have heard in the past that office spread, workplace spread is one of the areas. At this time, we are not touching the workplace in the private sector. Minister Dial Singh still appealed to those in the private sector to maintain vigilance in adhering to the COVID-19 protocols. Newly appointed Minister of National Security Fitzgerald Hines said he will be meeting with Police Commissioner Gary Griffith and senior divisional commanders to request that they implement and enforce COVID-19 measures. And I will be asking them to report to this team on a daily basis, their activity in terms of the enforcement of those regulations, where people will be made to feel it in their pockets if they practice the unthinking behavior of disregarding the security and the safety of all of us. The restrictions will take effect from midnight on Wednesday and will end on Sunday, May 16. Kimberly D'Souza. TTT News. The Ministry of Health is reporting 81 new positive COVID-19 cases for Trinidad and Tobago. The Health Ministry says the cases reported reflect samples taken during the period April 18 to 20 and not the past 24 hours. The total number of active COVID-19 cases now stands at 1,023. 310 people are in state quarantine facilities and 96 patients remain at hospital. The number of deaths remains at 157. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley is refuting claims that the COVID-19 spike happened due to persons vacationing in Tobago over the Easter holiday. In a media release, Dr. Rowley rejected any attempt to misrepresent the facts and the placing of blame on Tobago by hosting a few thousand who chose to enjoy the ambience. The Prime Minister reminded that even before Easter, the areas of spiking community spread were in County Carony and County Victoria. He added that subsequently the third most affected zone was St. George East, a reality he said was confirmed by the Chief Medical Officer's data sheets today, Wednesday. Dr. Rowley said to separate the people of Tobago or their tourism economy for special hatred is misleading. Over in the Bahamas, as that nation is now in the midst of a third wave of COVID-19 infections, Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis has announced a raft of privileges for those that have been vaccinated. Kyle Walkeen of Our News has the details. I guess you can call it a push for more people to go and get vaccinated, but today the Prime Minister announced several privileges that will be made available to those who are fully vaccinated. Once they have received the second dose vaccine or they have met the vaccination requirements they do not need any further testing to move about through our Bahamaland. The Prime Minister calling off a list of privileges that we once had pre-COVID but now for those fully vaccinated. The $100 plus fee for RT-PCR tests in addition to the travel health visa has been a pain for many traveling from New Providence, Grand Bahama and Abaco. But Minnis revealing that those days will now be behind everyone who has gotten their second jab. And for those looking to enter the Bahamas, here's what takes effect May 1st. Those traveling to the Bahamas from outside of the country will be exempted from a COVID-19 test 
if they are fully vaccinated and have passed the two-week immunity period. Those not fully vaccinated must still present a negative result for a COVID-19 test. And after a year of being forced to only drive through or eat outdoors, indoor dining is making a return, but only for those fully vaccinated. Individuals can participate in a closed environment once all within the closed environment are fully vaccinated, then the mask would not be necessary. Minutes pointing to things like Junkanoo and independent celebrations that were able to occur pre-COVID and how vaccinated persons would be able to begin preparation. Those like myself who participate in Junkanoo, once we are all vaccinated, we can work within the Junkanoo shops among us all vaccinated individuals. But the country remains smack in the middle of a third wave. While he didn't announce any tighter restrictions, Minnis advised that there will be stricter enforcement of protocols. For Our News, I'm Kyle Joaquin. In sports, Cricket West Indies, CWI, are hopeful for a return to first-class cricket in the coming months, buoyed by the accelerated rollout of COVID-19 vaccines by regional governments. The governing body has been banking on a shortened first-class season, but with COVID-19 cases rising in several countries, speculation over a cancellation has heightened in recent weeks. However, CWI Chief Executive Johnny Grave said they remained, quote, optimistic and hopeful, end quote, of an improvement in the pandemic. So some amended version of first class season could be staged before the Caribbean Premier League scheduled to get on the way in August. And in other sporting news, Japan has announced a new virus state of emergency in Tokyo and three other regions of Friday. As the country battles surging infections just three months before the Olympic opening ceremony. The nation's virus outbreak remains much smaller than in many countries, but a recent uptick in cases has officials and medical professionals worried, even as the government and Olympic organizers insist this summer's games will go ahead. The new measures will run from April 25 to May 11. The country's Minister for Virus Response, Yashatoshi Nashimura, earlier warned of, quote, a strong sense of crisis, end quote, saying current restrictions were not sufficient. The games are scheduled to run from July 23 to August 8. And in the weather report, a combination of a strong high-pressure ridge, subsidence, and a thin layer of Sahara dust is responsible for the hazy conditions that have been affecting the island in recent days. Satellite images have shown that a thin layer of Saharan dust has drifted into the central and western Caribbean. Stable weather conditions with hazy skies due to the presence of suspended Saharan dust particles will prevail through the late Wednesday and gradually drift away from the island on Thursday. The arrival of the Saharan dust layer is not unusual and is normally expected between late April and October. As it relates to ash from the Le Soufer volcano, the Meteorological Service is not able to confirm any spike in sulfur dioxide and or ash across the island. Due to the presence of suspended Saharan dust particles in the forecast out of extreme caution, people who have asthma, allergies and other respiratory illnesses should take the necessary precautionary measures. And that's our news package. Thanks so much for making it PBCJ. Remember, keep safe.